In this lesson, we are going to go over solving quadratic equations. Uh, we are working in section 8.1 out of your book on page 633, and we are going to work problem numbers 2 through 8 even and 10 through 20 even. So first off, quadratic equations um, form a parabola, which if you have a coordinate plane, a parabola is a U-shaped figure. It will either be shaped upwards or downwards. And these right here are called your x-intercepts. And that is what you are actually solving for. So x-intercepts are where your graph crosses the x-axis. So when we are solving these quadratic equations, we are solving to find these x-intercepts. So there are three different ways to solve quadratic equations. So the first way that we are going to learn is by factoring. And that will cover problem numbers two through eight even on this section. Then we will learn how to solve by using the square root method which is going to cover problem numbers 10 through 20 even on section 8.1. And the third method is by using the quadratic equation, um, which is going to be the entire section just about of 8.2. So you'll have to look at another lesson to learn how to solve by using the quadratic equation. But for now, this is what we're working with, are the factoring and the square root method. So to solve by factoring, let's look at number two in our book. Number two says I have x squared plus five x plus six equals zero. One key point is to make sure that you always have your equation set equal to zero. If your equation is not set equal to zero, this will not give you an accurate answer. So please make sure that this always ends in a zero after the equal sign. So first we have to factor as long as we have it set equal to zero. So to factor, I always teach the AC method. So you identify your A, B, and C. A is the number in front of the X squared b is the number in front of your x, and c is the constant by itself, which is 6. Then we draw what I like to call the flying x. Your x squared is broken up between the two wings. a times c goes in this top section, which 1 times 6 is 6 and your b is five, and one goes down here. So now we wanna find out what multiplies to give you this top number, and adds to give you that bottom number. So we're gonna write out the factors of six. So it's one times six, and two times three. And we need to look at our signs. The only way to get a positive number by, when multiplying two numbers is by using a positive times a positive or a negative times a negative. But since we need to add them to get a positive five, we're gonna use the positive and a positive. So which one of these, when they are both positive, will add to give me a five? That answer is the two and the three. So now we finish up by writing x plus two and then x plus three equals zero. So now the point is to actually solve. So as a little side note, if I had x, y equals zero, 
where x equals a number and y equals a number. Well, one of these two has to equal a zero for this to be true. Because anytime you multiply zero times something, your answer is zero. So that means either my x plus two binomial has to come out to a zero, or my x plus three binomial has to come out to a zero. So now you solve by getting the x by itself. and you're finished. So your answer is x equals negative two and x equals negative three. So remember, we're finding the x-intercepts. So our, our quadratic equation would cross at where x equals negative two, which would be about here-ish probably, and x equals negative three, which is about where this is. Moving on to number four, and I just talked you through the factoring part just to give you um, a little bit of a background on factoring, but I'm not gonna walk you through this next one. So on number four, I have q squared minus five q minus 24 equals zero. <laughs> no, excuse me. So when you factor that out, you would get q minus 8 and q plus 3 equals 0. I can factor these out in my head, so that's why I didn't have to write out the AC method. And then I have to set each of these binomials equal to 0. So to solve, I add 8 to each side to get q equals 8. And you subtract 3 from each side here to get q equals negative 3. So your answers are positive 8 and negative 3. Number 6, I have 3x squared plus 10x minus eight equals zero. Can't do these in my head as quickly as I want to on the camera, so I'm gonna go ahead and write out my AC method. Your A is three, B is 10, C is negative eight. Put your three X up top this time. Whenever you have A that is a number other than one, you put the coefficient and the variable on top of the wings. A times three is negative, or A times C is negative 24, and then B is 10. So I wanna find out what multiplies to give me negative 24 and adds to give me 10. you might automatically see that two and 12 and four and six could both possibly give you a 10. So you have to look at your signs. So to get a negative, you have to have at least one positive and one negative to get a negative product. So I know one has to be positive, one has to be negative. Well, if I chose four and six, either way we do it, we would end up subtracting those numbers since they're opposites. So we would either end up with a positive two or a negative two. So I know I have to use two and 12. Since I need my 10 to be positive, I'm gonna make the bigger number positive. So I'm gonna use negative two and positive 12. Now, before we write our answer, we need to simplify these fractions and then that simplifies to be one over four. So I now have three X minus two and X plus four. And again, you should make sure all of these are set equal to zero. All the examples in the book apparently don't like to challenge you. So just be wary of that when you're doing homework and uh, test problems. So I have three X minus two equal to zero 
and then x plus 4 equal to 0. And now you solve. I'm going to add 2 to both sides, which gives me 3x equals 2. And then I'm going to divide by 3 to get x equals 2 thirds. And then I subtract 4, and I get x equals negative 4. And that's my answer for number 6. Moving on to number 8, I have 21z squared plus z minus 2 equals 0. So identify your a, b, and c. a is 21, b is 1, c is negative 2. And then you draw your x. 21z goes in my numerator. A times C goes up top, which is negative 42. B goes on bottom, which is a 1. So what multiplies to give me negative 42 and adds to give me a 1? I know 1 and 42 are factors. 2 and 21 are factors. 3 and 14 and then 6 and 7. So if I need to get a negative number, I know I'm going to have one positive and one negative. So my answer here, I'm going to need to use a negative 6 and a positive 7 if I want to get a positive 1 when I combine those. Now I simplify. So I need to think what number goes into 21 and 6. The answer is 3. So 3 goes into 21 7 times. 3 goes into 6 2 times. And then what number goes into 21 and 7? Seven? 7. So 7 goes into 21 3 times. 7 goes into 7 1 time. So I now have 7z minus 2 and 3z plus 1. And now I set them both equal to 0. Oops. So I'm going to add 2 to both sides to get 7z equals 2. Then I'm going to divide by 7. z equals 2 over 7. So that's my first answer. And then subtract 1 from each side to get 3z equals negative 1, divide by 3, so z equals negative 1 third. So those four problems explain how to solve by factoring. Now let's look at solving by using the square root method. This is the last method we are going to discuss in this lesson. So looking at number 10 in your book, I have x squared equals 144. And the directions say to use the square root method to solve each equation. So if you're going to solve by using the square root method, you probably are going to guess that you're going to be taking the square root of something. So we are going to take the square root of x squared to get rid of that squared. Because I don't care what x squared is, I want to know what x is. So I'm going to take the square root of one side, I have to take the square root of the other side. So that leaves me with x equals 12. But that's not the end of it. Because we have to put plus or minus 12, or you can write it as 12 and negative 12. Either way works fine. The reason it's plus or minus is because if you plug 12 into this x, well, 12 squared means 12 times 12, which is 144. So that checks. If we plug in negative 12 in for here, well, negative 12 times negative 12 is positive 144. So that checks as well. So we are finished. And you can write either plus or minus 12, or you can write 12 comma negative 12. Either way works fine. 
number 12 says I have p squared equals 18. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides, which gives me p equals plus or minus the square root of 18. But we're not finished. We can actually simplify this a little bit further. We learned how to do this in section 7.2 notes where we use a prime factorization tree to break down a number under a radical. So 18 breaks down to be 9 times 2 and 9 breaks down to be 3 times 3. So that gives me p equals plus or minus this pair of 3's come out as just 1 3 and that 2 is left under the radical. Fourteen says I have five x squared equals sixty-five. This problem is different from the other problems because before we already had the perfect square by itself. So we have to get that taken care of first. So we're going to divide each side by five to get rid of that coefficient, which will give us x squared equals thirteen. Now I can take the square root of both sides, which gives me x equals plus or minus the square root of 13. I can't break 13 down because it's a prime number. So that's it. Number 16, I have 3u squared minus 5. equals negative 32 and there is this little funky symbol that's in parentheses and it's a C that's got that little line through it. The book tells us that that means that this is going to come out to be an imaginary number. So first we have to get that u squared by itself. So we're going to add 5 to each side which will give me 3u squared equals negative 27. Then we're going to divide each side by 3 to get u squared equals negative 9. So to solve, we're going to take the square root of both sides to get u equals plus or minus. Square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of a negative number comes out as i. If you're not quite sure what the heck I just did, you are more than welcome to look at the notes from section 7.6. Now, number 18 says I have 2x minus 3 squared equals 5. Sorry about that. So we actually have the perfect square already by itself because if we have 2x minus 3 quantity squared, well that means 2x minus 3 times 2x minus 3, which is something times itself. So that's the definition of a perfect square. So we can take the square root of both sides and if I were to take the square root of this, my index tells me that I need 2 of a number to release it from the radical. Well, I do have 2 of the same thing, so they come out as 1, which would just be 2x minus 3. So because of the reason I just showed you here, we're going to have 2x minus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 5. Now we have to solve for x, so I'm going to add 3 to each side to get 2x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 5. Note that you could not write 3 square roots of 5. A lot of people try and do that on these problems, but if you have a number right next to a radical, that actually means multiplication. And we're not multiplying, we're adding. So that's why we have to put that 3 in front of the plus or minus, and then we divide by 2. 
So x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. The final problem in this lesson is number 20. 20 says that I have 3p minus 4 quantity squared plus 9 equals 0. So the first thing I need to do is get the perfect square by itself, which is that 3p minus 4 squared, to get 3p minus 4 squared equals negative 9. Then I take the square root of each side to get 3p minus 4. And if this part confuses you, look back at problem number 18 equals plus or minus 3i. Because the square root of 9 is 3, and then the square root of a negative is i. Then we add 4 to each side to get 3p equals 4 plus or minus 3i. And then we divide by 3. So we have p equals 4 plus or minus 3i divided by 3. Or if you went ahead and simplified it further, you could have written 4 over 3 plus or minus i, or just 1i. Either answer would have worked. I hope you have found this lesson to be beneficial. I wish you the best of luck.